to this webinar, which is really based around the practical recommendations for home supported learning. Uh, this is a new addition to our E4L calendar in response to home supported learning and COVID-19. Um, Tanya and I will walk you through this webinar today, but we would like you first to just introduce yourselves in the chat box to one another. Um, we'll kind of keep rolling, but we'd love you to keep the conversation going as we do that. Today's webinar has a real focus on practical resources for teachers and educators. Um, there are implications of course and learnings for parents. Uh, we'll also do a couple of um, covering off on the uh, resources that are helpful for school leaders. Um, primarily though, we'll be talking to our educator audience. For those of you who um, are new to Evidence for Learning, uh, we help great practice become common practice in education. And we help educators to increase learning by improving the evidence of what works and why. And we think that that is even more important now, even more urgent given the current constructs that we're working within. My name is Susanna Schoeffel. I am the Associate Director at Evidence for Learning. My responsibility is primarily around providing evidence-based guidance for educators. Um, and my colleague Tanya is here with me as well, so I'll introduce Tanya. Thanks, Susanna. Um, thank you all for taking the time to meet with us tonight in these um, extremely challenging circumstances that we're facing, not just in Australia, but throughout the world as well. We really appreciate your time and we've really worked hard and we hope that tonight is as beneficial as possible for you. My role is Associate Director as well, um, and I'm looking after the Teaching and Learning Toolkit. So I'd like to start off just by acknowledging that I myself am sitting on the lands here in my home environment in Melbourne. So I'm on the lands of the Wondery people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd really love to pay my respects to Elders past, present, future, and emerging. And I know that we're meeting throughout Australia tonight, that we've had registrations from all across these wonderful lands. And you can also pay respects to those as well. So I'd just like to start off by saying we've been absolutely overwhelmed and delighted by the response to this webinar. What I guess for me has been most impactful are the questions that you've asked. So we've had over um, 28 questions asked. We've had 146 people register from every state and territory across Australia, from every jurisdiction. What for me was really meaningful was your focus in on inclusion and how you can best help those students that really are surrounded by the most difficult circumstances or have learning, um, specific learning needs and how you can help them the most. So I thank you for uh, your dedication to those students and I'm incredibly moved by that and I feel very fortunate that we're able to sit here and hopefully provide you with some really practical information around how this can be, the evidence can best be translated into those settings. So this is an overview of what we'll be covering today. As I said, we got so many questions. We hope to get to some Q&A today, but we're gonna be focused predominantly in on answering those great questions that you've sent through to us on it in advance. So I just want to open with a couple of comments here. Um, I am conscious that we don't have a lot of time to dedicate to this because we want to make this as practical as possible, but just really important to call out a few of the challenges and opportunities that we are seeing emerge. One of the things that isn't on here that we just wanted to call out particularly is the growing understanding that we have around well-being in this space, um, that this is a particularly nuanced piece. Um, if we think about um, the hierarchy that Maslow outlines, that we are 
seeing something quite um, unprecedented in regards to how our families, um, the families of the children that we teach, but also ourselves as educators and our families are dealing with things um, and that there's a lot of kindness that needs to be put into our own circumstances um, and understood. So this pandemic is really having um, very deep effects and for some families, um, families who may be suffering from um, job losses, that education it might not be a front and centre for them. Um, even in our own homes, that might be hard to keep front and centre sometimes for us as educators. So I think just to call out that we're dealing with a quite a complex situation um, and that we're not expecting the same thing that we expected from educators, educators, um, parents uh, and education as we did a few weeks ago. Um, so just to set the scene a little bit there, Tanya and I wrote an article recently in Teacher Magazine published um, last week, which really looked at these things. Um, everything from the, the vulnerability that exists because of the digital divide, which is um, at serious risk of, of escalating during this period. But beyond that, there are added levels of complexity families who don't speak English um, or speak languages other than English or, or broken English that might have trouble uh, accessing and even communicating with schools. Um, we sometimes overlook the fact that uh, not all teachers feel comfortable and confident in this space either and that can be a challenge but, but um, I think framed as an opportunity also to say um, in a few weeks time or in a few months time, we're going to have a really skilled up workforce um, through necessity, um, but there's going to be some really positive, uh, positive effects to come out of that as well. Um, vulnerability is something that we're not going to brush over. It's a really big concern for us at E4L. Um, it's work that we're going to continue to look into in the next few weeks and obviously it comes with a level of complexity and even unpacking what vulnerability means um, and looks like in all of our different situations. Um, at a school level for leaders and for teachers, we, we encourage and ask you just to know your students as best you can. Um, even in that, there is vulnerability and there is additional resource. I, I feel for parents of, of prep children who are, um, who are in a really unique situation in their children only having a few weeks of school under their belt but also for the teachers who are trying to learn all about these new students. And I think this applies across, um, across all levels of schooling where we're seeing transitions. Um, so we won't go too much into those particular things, but just to set the scene, um, as we move to the next slide, we had quite a number of questions which were really based around what, what is effective in this space. We have got a few things to show um, to you, but I think the underlying message is this is um, quite unusual. This is a scenario that we're, we, no one was prepared for. Um, and certainly there are lessons that we can draw from um, schools of the air and from a whole lot of other projects that have tried and tested this. Um, there is some really strong research at the tertiary level to suggest um, what's good practice uh, and what is less effective. But the message from us is that we are currently um, doing rapid reviews into this space. So we'll be able to provide you not only with the outcomes of those reviews, but resources that are practical um, that draw on the research and the outcomes from that research. So this will be coming soon. And this is part of our new uh, home supported learning website, which is available under E4L's website, one section of it. Um, we will have this or have this filling out in the next couple of weeks. So we'll have more to prepare uh, and more to share with you then. What we do have for you um, and what we want to share and, and help you to use, but also for your feedback so that we understand if this is useful and what other gaps there are, is a lot of our resources um, that we've published uh, already, our guidance reports in particular, have got really strong lessons that can apply and we're seeing teachers apply them into the home supported learning context. Um, we're using home supported learning as our term for this and we understand that for every state, for every school, um, this is quite a different concept um, and people will be unpacking that in different ways. But what we've drawn out are the things that are working really well in schools that have 
uh, transferable appeal. So things that are best bets for us, what is the uh, evidence telling us is strong and how can we start to translate that so that we can guide home supported learning in a really productive way. Um, we're not expecting schools to run in the same way just in an online environment um, by any means, but these types of things can be shared um, and translated further for parents as well. So you'll see a few of our resources on the screen. Um, these are all available, uh, as Tammy said before, on our website um, under COVID Home Supported Learning. Um, thank you, we will send the link around and when you've received the presentation um, today, you'll have all of the links embedded as well. Um, but shared reading support strategies to help support parents at home plan, monitor and evaluate learning, which comes from our uh, metacognition and self-regulated learning platform. And these will, we'll go into a little bit of detail about some of these things today, um, but just know that we've broken these down for you so that you can see considerations, um, particularly that relate to home supported learning tips and really the summary of the approach from the evidence that we see. So these are for you here. Um, I think there's three overarching messages that I, share as part of this. Um, the first one comes from our implementation guidance report and that is do fewer things better. We know that um, the quantity of what we used to do in schools is not going to work at the moment, but we need to focus on quality. Um, the second thing is to make evidence informed decisions based on what works for you and your students. Um, you're in the best place to make that decision you know your students and your context and your families better than anyone else. Um, but use what we can provide you and the other resources out there to start making those decisions. And the third thing, which feels a little bit counterintuitive, I suppose, at the moment, is spend a bit of time trying to monitor and evaluate what you're doing. There are likely to be some really strong messages and learnings that come out of this um, pandemic response that we will be able to use to make our education system stronger in the future. If you can find out how your students are responding to things, um, we're in a much better place to in a few months time think about what really worked well um, in case we go through situations like this in the future or if there's things that we can take back to the classroom. The next slide shows another one of our resources. This resource is particularly designed for school leaders. However, there are some strong messages that teachers can take away too. Um, so our implementation guidance report sets out a process of um, a, a staged approach to implementation. Um, really important for any change process, and this is used far more broadly than education, but it's getting traction here as well. Um, so this is an example plan that we have developed in response to COVID. It's not going to fit for every school and that's not its, its intent, but we've designed this and it comes with a, um, an editable template as well so that schools can start to articulate that change process. Really important, even though it's a very short term project at the moment, to be looking at how we develop our staff, communicate with families and have a, our own consistent approach to what home supported learning looks like for our school um, and potentially the schools around us as well. So another resource there for you, for teachers and leaders, it will really help you to think about what change looks like and what are those elements that we see um, are feature when change is done really well. Um, and we wanna, we wanna try and support schools to do that at the moment because there's a lot of uncertainty. I wanted to talk a little bit now about um, a couple of those things that we'd mentioned. So metacognition, um, I'll also talk a little bit about the role parents can play. Um, these resources um, have got quite a depth of evidence sitting behind them. So they're actually um, distilled from our guidance reports. You might be familiar with these already, but they're also available on our website. Our guidance reports obviously are written in a, um, a lens that places students in the classroom because that is where we know they learn best. Um, and although they might not learn as much or as well um, or progress as far at home, it's really important that we still give them the opportunities to develop during this time. Metacognition and self-regulation is a really terrific lever to helping students learn at home. 
We know from school settings that it has got a high impact. We're really confident in the evidence. So it's our evidence security for padlocks um, and it's a fairly low cost uh, approach. And so these, if you're not familiar with our toolkit, um, are the common icons that we use across all of the approaches. Um, so please dive into that. Um, again, they're obviously a school-based um, approach, but the lessons can be drawn out. What we see is this plays out quite differently um, at a number of levels, but um, you'll see in a, um, another article that Tanya and I have written, which draws on some of this evidence. Students who are more metacognitive, who have better self-regulation at the moment, are probably going to be better, uh, better able to manage this new learning environment. Having said that, we can still do things to get students who aren't quite there on board. And that might be things like explicit teaching of metacognitive strategies. How do they actually sit down and plan and monitor and evaluate their own learning? A couple of the resources that we've developed draw on strategies for that. So please jump in and have a look at those when you get a moment. Um, but metacognition and self-regulation, we see as a really um, high lever point for this work as well. The next slide shows um, a little bit of an introduction as to the parents um, positioning in this. Again, I think the, the caveat around that is, and, and Tanya alluded to it earlier from her own experience, um, parents are in a very hard place at the moment. They're not teachers. They don't have that, um, or not necessarily teachers. Um, they haven't had all of the training that you have had as educators. They don't have all of that experience that you have had as educators. Um, and we're also not asking them to be educators. Um, I think there's a really clear message around how we communicate that to parents. A lot of this is just about making sure that we have the same expectations. There are some things that we can ask parents to do um, that will help their own child engage in home supported learning. Things like creating regular routines, study habits, um, making sure like, a, like you would ask a teaching assistant or an aide to do that they are prepared for the lesson. Do they have stationary items that they need? Do they have pen and paper? Um, communication again, that's a really core, core um, recommendation from our guidance report, which is working with parents to support students learning. Um, and that is about how we ensure that we're um, getting the right messages to parents, but also that they have the opportunity to feed back to the school. And that's gonna be a really crucial point at this time so that we can understand how students are progressing. The next slide is just um, a snapshot of the, how we can engage with parents in this way. So again, these are resources for schools, not for parents. Um, but this shows a little bit of the breadth that we're dealing with. In any um, situation, we see engagement from parents changing between when a student enters school to when they leave school. And so the school's approach um, needs to be tailored for that age group. We've got a couple of resources here that will particularly help schools give parents quite um, practical guidance on things that they can do Again, there are levels of vulnerability that will make these um, not work in every situation and we're aware of that. The first one there for um, uh, the younger children, uh, even from um, early year settings, but some of these strategies when we're talking about oral language development, um, quite relevant um, further up the school as well. Shared reading support is a, is a um, particular resource that we've developed for sort of primary age students. This helps teachers to pick up the tips that parents will find accessible. Um, again, based on the evidence of what we know works in this setting. Um, shared reading actually is quite, um, quite strongly reported or strongly researched in the home setting because it's often a homework task that we see happen in um, primary years. And this third one, um, again, goes to the changing relationship between parents and schools at secondary school. So features of an effective self-regulated learner, what that looks like. And we might expect parents at this stage to be a little bit more hands-off if the student is able to start to self-regulate and engage in that way on their own. 
or this might be a really valuable resource for parents whose child needs a little bit um, more support from the home as well. So there's one more um, piece here, which I won't read in, in full, which talks to um, the, the role of parents um, drawing on lessons from teaching assistants. So we've got quite good research into um, how effective teaching assistants can be. Um, again, we're not suggesting that parents um, are teaching assistants. They don't have the, the training and the experience that teaching assistants um, do, just like we speak about our teachers. But there's a few strategies that teachers and teaching assistants use together, which we can then distill to share with parents as well. So providing the right amount of support at the right time, all of these things re require a little bit of understanding about what the child is doing. One of the really easy strategies is teaching triage, much like we would ask um, a TA in a classroom to do, to roam, to understand how students are going and to flag with the teacher where students need more help. Um, given that we have communication set up between parents and schools in many cases, the parent can actually play that role of the, the sort of teaching triage to say, this is somewhere where I can't assist my child, but I think that they need further support. I can raise that with my child's teacher. Fantastic. Thank you, Susanna. So as Susanna mentioned before, we're going to be publishing um, a piece of work with the Education Endowment Foundation, our partners on uh, systematic rapid review um, very soon um, to address this more. But as of tonight, I'll, I'll show you the evidence that we do have available and we'll be doing more work in this space and populating our website as we go. So most of the studies that we have are actually based on what is happening within the school environment and not specifically focused in on this type of environment because as we know, We've never been in this pandemic situation before. So, but we do know that technology does, there is a hope that it can improve practice. We know that within the classroom, it can add additional learning. We're moving to full technology in some cases here. So that is a different circumstance. We know that there are some programs that can be useful in helping our students um, practice basic skills. We know that, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail when I'm talking about in response to your questions around those students with additional learning needs, which is also applicable to all students, how we can best really use that technology. So this is drawing from a report from the EEF. Um, you can see it up there. Um, how to use digital technology to improve um, learning, which is freely accessible from their site and linked out from our site as well in that area. So we know that in this current circumstance, a good way to reach all children um, is verbal feedback. This can take the form of videos um, and also, also just um, sound bites as well of providing that feedback to your students. Now, they have found that technology can um, actually improve and has the potential to improve both assessment and feedback in terms of speed and efficiency. Um, but as all things, it has to do with implementation and the pedagogy that is used in that current circumstance. So an idea with this is that if you could look for um, common misconceptions that you can see, if you're getting assessment in and you see a common misconception throughout your students, different students' work, you could record a soundbite and then release that to a certain all the students that show the same misconception and that could save you time with the marking, not just um, now, but in the future as well. So that's one way that potentially things can improve, but I know that it is incredibly complicated at the moment and a steep learning curve as well. So now we're gonna to move to where we're um, answering more of the questions that you've provided to us. 
And we have Pauline as well, um, Dr. Pauline Ho, on the chat box as well. So if you do have, and I can see that she is um, answering questions now as well. So if you have any questions, do feel free to put them in and she'll answer them. And if not, we'll take them on notice and we'll definitely get back to you about them. We'll either run another webinar or we'll just answer them in person via email or however works best for you all. So this is really what I was talking about at the start. These are the all individual questions from yourselves from all across Australia, asking very similarly about how can we best look after those students that are most vulnerable and make sure that they're being provided with the best learning possible online. So, our partners at the Education Endowment Foundation have produced a guidance report and it was published just this year. So, and it was based on a very thorough literature review of all the literature around helping to support students with additional needs. And I'll just give you a second to read the quote firstly from Professor Becky Francis, who is the incoming chief executive with Kel Kevin Collins, so Kevin Collins having recently um, left the CEO position. I'll give you a second to read that and then just from an assistant principal as well. what really resonated was that in that second quote was the the bringing of the happiness and the feeling of safety and really preparing students to flourish and feel truly included within society and that's I guess why I was so impacted by all your questions coming in is that as educators I think we all feel that need and and want to really improve the lives of our students and include them all. So there were five key recommendations that they've taken from their large literature review. That literature review is also um, publicly available. It's a very long document. They've summarised it into a 41 page document. I've summarised that into a few slides for this presentation um, and an article that I'll be writing soon as well or publishing soon. So we've got five key recommendations there. Um, so really the first one, and this was really what Susanna was alluding to at the start as well. We're not going to cover this in detail, but it's really a positive and supportive environment. Um, and Susanna was mentioning that's important, not just for our, our um, students, but especially for ourselves in these really difficult times. Also building an ongoing and really detailed understanding of your students' needs and that's really on an individual basis for some of your students will have to be in order for them to achieve the best that they possibly can. And we know that this is a large ask for educators, um, especially those of you in high school settings when you're dealing with say 120 students as, as I was. Um, also making sure that all students have access to high quality teaching. And this is something that is common for all students. So you will reach those with special learning needs with excellent, but just more scaffolded versions of what you are currently doing. And I'm sure what you're doing in your schools at the moment. And then thinking about, okay, well, are there other ways that we can support students' specific learning needs if it gets to the point where the day-to-day -day learning isn't really meeting their needs, then thinking about, are there further supports or intensive support that we can provide one-to-one? -one? Um, and then it's working effectively with teaching assistants, which of course is looks different in this new model. And we covered off some of what that looks like with parents, but we'll cover off what it looks like really with teaching assistants who have qualifications and who are a, a part of our, a value part of our profession. Maybe I'm a bit biased when I say that as my husband is a teaching assistant, but I know how hard you all work to support the students in need. All right, so I think 
with all of this research and the more that I read, really um, the use of labels, um, helpful in understanding some basic ideas, but really it comes down to the individual. And that's the same with every individual in your classroom. And you'll only really get to this by planning, acting, reviewing and doing for every student. So you will try something online now. Um, you'll try to reach out to a student that you know has suffered from perhaps disengagement in the past and you know may be struggling. So you'll give them a video, just trying to encourage them to engage. So you'll be trying different things at the moment, experimenting with new online ways of communicating with your students. So we know that high quality teaching is, and there's several different ways to go about this that are important and some specific techniques that we know that can reach all children, especially those with special and additional needs. So if we think about flexible grouping so and i'll take you through what this means more so in an online environment so flexible grouping just being as distinct from streaming it's based on where is the student at currently it's constantly fluid it moves based on the student's current achievement levels and students can move in and out of these groups as as all human beings do um, Susanna was talking about cognitive and metacognitive and self-regulatory strategies. We'll go into a few more specific examples around that, specifically around the cognitive strategies. We'll go um, a little bit into explicit instruction um, and also the use of technology specifically for those um, with additional learning needs and also scaffolding as well. So this is just a summary of each one of those different approaches. And then what I've done is try to think about what's one practical example, because I'm really trying to think what's practical for you, what's going to help in your online or classroom environment or blended environment currently. Um, and that's something like a task plan in an online environment. Um, explicit instruction, well, that's then become video clips and short audio clips. I've seen some lovely examples already of what teachers are producing for my son and I'm sure what you're producing for your children. Um, with the use of technology, you can have students actually produce videos themselves that can be very beneficial of them self-modeling through a process. And I'll walk you through that. We then have cognitive strategies that I'll talk about. And for flexible grouping, those of you, I saw some of you do have Zoom. This isn't possible on all platforms, but those of the, you that do, you can have breakout rooms where you can be trying to more have more Vygotsky in your life so that there is students talking to one another and helping one another at the same level. Um, and as I was speaking before, those groups will move and change and you'll move them dependent on what is happening. Yeah, that is a good point. Um, bearing in mind that you'll need support staff. So if possible, if there was a support staff that could go into a breakout room with those students, because I do understand the safety concerns and the encryption concerns currently that have been emerging. So I'd love you to tell me what scaffolding you're providing for your students at the moment. This is just a, a task plan that has been generated by a school. Um, I've seen some that my son is using and it just outlines some really trying to get the student to break down what are the steps that they need to do to complete the task how long will each take and sometimes self rewards can be a really important way to help students as well. So if anyone wants to type in examples into the chat box, that would be fantastic. 
Now, another example, so there are lots of different um, cognitive strategies. You have um, Venn diagrams, you have my personal favourite of the hierarchical concept map. You've all, if you've ever tuned in before, heard me talk about those, has seen your secondary mathematics, love them. Um, what is really nice about this, the Freya model, um, is that it can be really useful for students with additional learning needs, is that emphasis on non-examples. And this can really help to, um, to move, help students to move past misconceptions that have arisen in their mind. So let us know any cognitive organisers that you're using currently. I'll pop those into the chat box. So what we have here is a worked example. So this is looking at a planet. So you can see the definition is in there. We've got the characteristics. We've got our non-examples and then we've got worked out examples as well of the Freya model in practice. So I thought that this was quite nice and could be used easily online um, in just a scaffold. In, in a template, I'd just put that together on PowerPoint and students could type straight into it and that would really help scaffold their learning. All right, so looking at technology. So three different broad categories we have here. We have instructional apps that are providing instruction, modeling or practice opportunities for wide variety of skills. Then we have our non-instructional apps and then we have our speech generating apps. Um, in our non-instructional apps, there can be apps that help students to take notes. Um, and these can also be provided to provide audio feedback and also present explicit instruction presentations as well. If we have a look at those, and that's a really, okay and Kim was just a lovely meta-analysis that was solely focused in on, hopes people don't think that's a contradiction of terms, but I do think meta-analysis are lovely. So a lovely meta-analysis that was focused in on just looking at students with additional needs and what technology and what can actually really benefit. So within this, um, what they found when they looked at all the studies that they could find that were robust were that these technologies had specific elements within them. The first being explicit instruction. So that's really the teaching of um, skills and concepts in small steps. Using examples and non-examples, having a clear and unambiguous language. So, and also anticipating and planning for common misconceptions and highlighting essential content and removing distracting information. What I thought was a really interesting way for students with additional needs to learn was for them to actually record themselves so the teacher can send them step by step instructions and I know that's what you're sending to your students anyway say how to solve uh, an equation and then what the student can do is actually video record themselves taking each one of those steps writing down each one of those steps and then they have they've taught themselves that way and so that had quite a significant effect size because they can stop at any stage, re-watch the video. It's the same with you giving you explicit instruction in video, but though them actually having to create it, it has more complexity within that and they are having to think about that more deeply. I guess it's the same as ourselves as teachers. If we teach something, then we truly have a chance of understanding it. Then we have video modeling. So the teachers are creating the, the videos, the opportunity in that is stopping and starting and taking as long as they want um, and rewinding if something is is not making sense to them especially those that struggle with um, understanding written communication so that can really be a, a way to support them 
Um, they also found, which is a little bit out of your control, but is interesting to think about is a constant time delay. So within the program, there was a set time that was quite prolonged that would ensure that the student have enough time to respond. And we know that that's one of the techniques in effective use of teaching assistants as well. And teachers in general is leaving a significant delay time. So as we said, we'll be publishing more in the technology space in the weeks to come. So in applying all these strategies, there's some really some overarching concepts here that we're thinking about, which is what's the need of that specific student? Whether the, what are we actually trying to teach them? What is it that they are having difficulties with? And then it's thinking about some students will require for that to be taught multiple times. And that's why we're talking about the rewinding and watching the video again, and a more intense focus on a smaller number of concepts over a longer period of time. And then is the really the, I think the art and science of teaching, and that's what you bring to your jobs every day is thinking, okay, what's that looking like for my student? You're planning, you're acting, and you're reviewing, and you're making sure that you can see progress for that student. So if we know that that isn't having the desired impact that we would, and we can't see the desired impact for just whole class teaching, well then we can take it up step by step. But what they have found is that to be really cautious with this, and also in an online environment would be difficult to manage, could be managed by teaching assistants, but it'd have to think it through. But just as a general principle, then you can have a targeted intervention. And then at the very top level, you have the specialist support. So it just depends on how your student is progressing and what is best for them. But really the take home message is, if at all possible, how can the current learning be modified to meet their needs rather than um, targeted and specialist support, but that is there when required. So, we know that the same rules apply online as they do in the classroom. If you do have access to teaching assistants or integration aids or whatever they are called within your state. You can see here on the right hand side of the slide, there's quite a spread of the impact of teaching assistants. So if they're used ineffectively um, with more of a, a method where they are taken out of the classroom or they are just sitting specifically with the teaching assistant all the time, we see that that can have a negative impact on the student's learning. If the teaching assistant is helping more generally, that can be positive. So the same ideas exist in this online space. The aid reports are a teacher. The teacher sends that information then on to the level coordinator. Um, you can help them support your students. They can send videos. I saw a delightful video today um, being sent out just to help students to try re-engage. And then the response back was that, and from the parent and the and the child was, was that it meant a great deal for them just for someone to say, look, we're really looking forward to you completing this piece of assessment this piece of work, can't wait to hear from you. Just something as simple as that from a teaching assistant can really be meaningful at the moment. And then they can answer questions and support in technical issues as well. So these are things that we're talking about for teaching assistants. They're not replacing teachers. They have different qualifications. We were talking about that skill set on the right hand side to encourage in parents as well. We don't really go to the avoid with the parents 
because it's really is different. They, they are different roles that they are playing and they are at different qualifications. So these are the key skills that we're encouraging in teaching assistants online. So we're really moving as much as possible to a model where students are self-scaffolding with increasing their metacognition and their self-regulation. So that is just the TA observing the student working. The prompting, the TA is using wait time and then coming in and asking, have you seen that diagram that your teacher put, put up if they're on an online chat in relation to that piece of assessment? Or they're cluing, they're saying, have you looked at the ruler? How is that gonna help you solve this particular problem? The next level of support in increasing support is modeling. So the TA can actually model for the student what success looks like in that task. And then there's the correction. So we're really wanting this to decrease over time and increase the student's independence. So we had a lot of questions about feedback and how we can build relationships online, which is difficult and tricky. As I was saying before, videos can be very helpful um, when you're explaining key concepts and building rapport with your students and you can use a chat function as often as possible and also encourage your TAs um, and integration aides to go through and respond to comments as well. So I think that that's, that can be an excellent use of their time. So in looking at how do we provide successful feedback online? Those questions around differentiation. We can use differentiated success criteria. Extension activities can be provided within the lesson plans that you're providing on Google Docs or in Seesaw. Um, you can look for and make note of common misconceptions and then verbally respond to those or you can also produce videos of providing snapshots of feedback. So this is the different types of levels that we know and whether they're effective or not so effective in providing feedback to students. This is work that we started off with AITSL and then also worked with the Education Endowment Foundation. This is just a worked example here. So really at that process and self-regulation level is where we see they are the most powerful. Now, if you want to chat into, your, into the chat box, how would you give feedback on self-regulation on a current task that you are doing? This is a really tricky task I'm asking of you five minutes before closing, but I know you are all keen and yes, you will get the presentation um, because you're all here on a Tuesday night. And now I'm gonna hand back to Susanna. As we wrap up, and thank you, Tanya, um, there were a couple of other questions that came through to us which we thought were um, valuable to call out. Some of them were valuable because they were particularly difficult um, and particularly important. This was one of them, how best to support young people in vulnerable households. And this question popped up in the chat box as well. Um, this is something that we're working on, Tanya mentioned before, that we're, we're looking at rapid reviews of the evidence and with a particular focus on vulnerabilities as well. Um, in absence of something more concrete to share with you, um, a, few, a few reflections from us. Um, AITSL Standard 1, which you'll all be familiar with, is know students and how they learn. And this is really about um, tapping into your knowledge of students and families to make that decision um, as someone who has got uh, enormous amount of expertise to bring to that. Um, differentiate, and this probably goes beyond a little bit of our, our um, common use of the word differentiation. Some students might not be able to access 
your teaching currently because there are so many other things happening for them. Differentiation might be just a phone call to make sure that they're on track and their wellbeing is, is doing all right. Um, it might be that there's other support there that they need before they can even get into a space that they're going to be a productive learner. Um, and in addition to that, there are a number of um, system provisions in place. Um, we haven't listed these because they're different in every state and territory at the moment um, to enable vulnerable students to access education on site. And we know that this um, is not always going to work out as, as clearly as it's written um, that some of those students who are likely to disengage um, will probably not be the ones that come back as um, putting their hands up as vulnerable. But um, be guided by your department and your association on, on this. Um, there was a, a number of questions as well um, that based around early childhood education um, that also have quite um, impressive implications for foundation um, and the early years of schooling. So we wanted to sort of package those together. Um, again, this is a space that, that we do work in at Evidence for Learning. We've got a number of resources. Um, you, you saw the oral language ones before. Um, so these are um, uh, here for you to access, for you to provide feedback on, some of them are internal um, uh, resources that Evidence for Learning has developed, our toolkit, uh, as well as the research summaries, um, oral language development. A, a number of them are also um, external, but also you will find these on our website. So these are there for you to, um, to start unpacking um, and using your professional judgment as well to see how they fit for you. Um, so yes, there are a number of things that you can do there. A couple of key takeaways to end with, um, and then I'll, I'll invite Tanya to um, close for today. Um, if we could ask you to leave with a few things, um, this is what we had, had come to a conclusion on. Do fewer things better. Communicate, and this applies to families and schools with your peers and your colleagues. Um, communicate for your own wellbeing, but also so that your um, I've got a common understanding and you're building your community um, more broadly. Build on what you know and you do already. Just because we're in a new situation doesn't mean it needs a completely new approach. There are amazing things happening within schools. You've got amazing practices under your belt from your years of experience as teachers. Um, think about how you can tweak and change and apply those to this new situation. Um, hopefully that will make it a little bit less daunting. Make evidence-informed decisions based on what you know works for you and your students um, and monitor and evaluate as you go. Um, so those are our recommendations and I'll hand over to Tanya now to tell you where all of these resources um, can be found. Thanks, Susanna. So everything can be found in our COVID-19 home supported learning environment. I know we also had a question about why we're using the term home supported. We just wanted to make it clear that it was led by educators and supported by parents. And just to really make that clear that that professional expertise really sits with you as educators. So that's the terminology that we have adopted with that. So that was a great question. Thanks, Nicole, because I could see you're online. Okay, great. Um, how to get in touch. Here are our emails feel free to reach out to us if you've got any other questions. We're happy to run another webinar like this if it was helpful and answer whatever questions you have. Um, subscribe to our e-news that goes out regularly. We're on Twitter and Facebook. We've released some videos recently on the implementation guidance report on the toolkit as well. We have more webinars coming up. We will be specifically doing a webinar focused in on computer um, technology within the home learning environment. Um, so watch this space, we're releasing that date soon. And I just wanted to close off with um, thank you for your precious time tonight. Mm -hmm.